Hello and welcome to today's RIMS webinar sponsored by Tuvsud Global Risk Consultants. Harness the power of data for better insurance outcomes. I am Justin Smollison, Business Content Manager here at RIMS, the Risk and Insurance Management Society. A few notes before we begin. If you have a question for the presenters during today's session, please submit them by writing in the question box. Feel free to ask at any point in the presentation. We will reserve time at the end for Q&A. Following this session, the recording will be available through the on-demand events page of rims.org and all downloads and contact information will be accessible to the sponsor. RIMS is thrilled to welcome a global audience. And now I will hand it off to our moderator, Jared Shelley of Tuvsud. Hey, thank you, Justin. Um, as Justin said, my name is Jared Shelley from Global Risk Consultants. I'll serve as the moderator for today's webinar. And today we're talking about data. Specifically, the importance of combining property data with risk data to drive better strategies and insurance outcomes. The agenda is as follows. We will discuss the primary factors impacting today's property mar insurance market, explain property market dynamics, and discuss the evolving role of the risk manager. All with a focus on one thing, data, and its ability to drive better risk strategies and outcomes. Before we begin, I'd like to take a quick moment to explain a new partnership between Global Risk Consultants and Archipelago that gives risk managers and owners of large commercial real estate portfolios actionable insights into their property risk data. With an API connection to GRC's risk engineering database, risk managers can improve efficiency, increase transparency, and drive better financial outcomes. Working together, we are helping businesses respond to the hard market, enrich data with artificial intelligence, house all their information and data in one place, and so much more. And now we'd like to have the panelists introduce themselves. Uh, Hemant, would you like to go first? Sure. Thanks, Jared. Thanks for kicking this off. And uh, Peter, it's wonderful uh, to see you again. It was great catching up just a couple of weeks ago at RIMS. Uh, it's great to be your partner, and I'm looking forward to this uh, conversation. Yeah, so, Hemant, go ahead. No, please, Peter. Go ahead. It was Hemant and I have spent some time together over the last 60 days or so and uh, in person uh, recently in Atlanta and previous to that in New York. And we're delighted to have this conversation with you today. Uh, I'm Peter Lin. I'm the vice president of engineering at Global Risk Consultants, a TUFSUD company. My responsibility is our client relationships, our partnerships and our proposition and solution development. And Hemant, how about a little bit about your background and what your role is? Sure. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Peter. So I'm a co-founder and CEO of Archipelago. And at Archipelago, uh, we serve risk management teams of large owners and operators of commercial property. And our AI-powered platform enables them to manage and maintain high-quality risk and property data to power more proactive risk management decisions themselves and also enables them to effectively collaborate with their brokers and their insurance partners by sharing high quality information via Archipelago as a virtual data room uh, across the market value chain uh, to help increase the efficiency and effectiveness of the whole end-to-end -end placement process. Um, I'm, uh, Peter, as, as you know, I'm, uh, I'm a reformed catastrophe modeler. Um, and uh, prior to founding Archipelago, uh, in 2018, um, I was uh, a co-founder um, of a firm called RMS, a catastrophe modeling firm, and led RMS all the way through 2018. So I've spent most of my career, uh, actually the totality of my career, uh, serving the global insurance property vertical, uh, initially focusing on insurance companies and reinsurance companies, helping them develop effective strategies to manage, quantify, and diversify their catastrophic risk. And that lifetime dating myself of experience uh, led to the uh, the formation of Archipelago in 2018. And it's great to be your partner, Peter, and to take this uh, whole capability to the next level. Yeah, thank you, Hamid. And we are excited, GRC is excited to have this partnership with Archipelago. We understand the importance of data um, and the analytic applications that you just mentioned. When we think about when we think about GRC or global risk consultants, we our our principal purpose is to assess 
to quantify and to mitigate property risk. And that has a number of uh, benefits to our clients, such as reducing operating costs, positioning the businesses for future resiliency, optimizing access to insurance markets, and, and importantly, empowering those clients with the data that we have that we have been and are going to be talking about. But I think that before we get into more of that, I'd like to start off with having making a few remarks on the property market today. Jared, if you could move the slide, thank you. So today there's a lot going on in a very, very dynamic uh, property insurance market. There's a, there's a number of factors that I'm gonna just uh, touch on and Hemet, you and I have discussed these before, but for the benefit of the audience, we of course, we have um, a, a an intense uh, nat cat situation happening right now, um, aggravated by climate change, which has led to effectively a bifurcated market uh, insured losses as you know, from severe weather are expected to hit historical highs in 2023 and frankly continue to, we could be expect to continue to see more nat cat. And that also includes non-traditional cats. Um, of course, we, a lot of people are thinking about um, hurricanes and, and, and earthquakes. So we also think about some of these others that are becoming uh, more known, the convective storms, the wildfires, even things like civil unrest and communicable disease. And we all absolutely know something about that from the, from the recent past. And the other thing to consider here is that underwriting from the major carriers um, have made corrections uh, to make an underwriting profit, something that they hadn't done for a number of years. And so underwriters to, and many carriers said, hey, wait a minute, you know, this can't continue. We, we've got we've to adjust our business so that we actually start making money um, on the property line. The values that we're talking about, very important, um, are, are critical right now in terms of how um, a client is, is being, at the end of the day, charged for their insurance, where the impact of inflation, um, the effect on recoveries, the effect on mitigation has had a major impact. And fundamentally, Hammond, as you know, a property insurance is not that complicated. It's basically rate times value. And value, right, value is the critical part in that in that basic little formula where we want to make sure from a client perspective that those values are accurate. They, they're not good if they're too low and they're not good if they're too high. And just a couple other things I wanted to, to touch on too, Hamid, is the supply chain exposures that we that we're looking at right now, including contingent uh, BI exposures are affecting the market. Reinsurance is not to be underestimated. The reinsurers are looking at what's happening right now and saying, hey, you know what? At, at the end of the day, this is also affecting us. Um, and we also were seeing from a GRC side, um, certain industries are tending to be more affected by this. Now, part of that is perhaps geographic, which could very well be, but certainly food and beverage, uh, gaming and hospitality have seen um, significant um, stress in the market. And at the end of the day, when we think about it, risk quality, um, a well-managed risk, a risk that has relatively low losses, low exposures, is doing a good job of managing their their their, um, their property risk is something that's viewed favorably, um, obviously within the own client's organization themselves, but also by the markets. The common denominator, as we've talked about, is data and associated technology. Data and associated technology is a, is a basic um, foundation of all of these things that we've just talked about. Tammy, what do you think? Well, I have to uh, first note that if I turned off my virtual background, uh, you'd see a whiteboard full of equations. And I, I do have a tendency in those who know me in the market to maybe overcomplicate uh, some of these formulations, but I love your the simplicity and elegance of, of, of the reminder that uh, you know, premium is rate times exposure. And you know, rate is increasingly uh, in this market environment being driven by highly technical factors as the industry gets far more disciplined about um, objectively, analytically, um, and algorithmically um, assessing what is the appropriate rate for this unit of risk. Um, and that's being driven by deep technical factors. Um, and then uh, exposure, you know, is a function of the valuations of the property, the equipment's contents, inventories in the buildings, the time element exposures associated with the buildings. 
And exposure is also uh, increasingly in this capacity constrained market, um, uh, initially uh, uh, in part driven by the reinsurance market dynamics, uh, washing into the insurance market uh, in this last renewal cycle. Um, it's capacity constrained. So exposure is very dear um, in peak accumulation zones. So you've got this dual factor of exposure driven uh, underwriting and accumulation management uh, driven by valuations and exposures, uh, particularly in capacity constrained areas and deeply technical rate driven calculations, but being driven by more disciplined underwriting uh, and pricing practices. And the common denominator, Peter, as you note, know, to, to both of these factors is the data um, that actually technically describes uh, the attributes and characteristics, the values, the exposures, the COPE, the secondary modifier, the fire protection system, the risk control engineering practices, uh, the roof system that was happening in the building. Around. All these factors are the data that describes the reality of the property, and they are being considered deeply uh, by the underwriters um, as they underwrite price um, and allocate capacity uh, to risk. And this is um, uh, this trend has been building uh, for years. You know, I think there's a, a famous quote. I, I'm I'm probably going to get the attribution wrong, but I think it has to do with uh, 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 a very different context. But things go slowly, and then they go quickly. Um, and these trends have been building for a long time. You know, it's it's you know it seems like a lifetime ago when I first sat down with carriers and talk to them about the notion that you should be quantifying earthquake risk, not by accumulating your TIVs by earthquake zone, but by actually introspecting where's precisely the building located, what precisely is the construction of the building, when was this thing built. Um, but these things have been building over time, and we're really seeing it now in the retail property markets, uh, this conversion of rate and exposure driven by technical consideration is creating this, as you say, bifurcated markets where at capacity um, and, and uh, rate are being focused on, where they underwriters are confident that they understand the technical attribution of the exposure so they can accurately assess the risk. And those that they're uh, uncertain about, uh, they pass. They've got a lot of opportunities to deploy their capital right now uh, against top tier risks. And you know all, all the risk management teams uh, are essentially competing uh, for insurer capacity and really need to differentiate themselves with detailed data um, that uh, accurately describes the underlying characteristics of these properties. No, and that's and that's a great comment. And one of the things I wanted to sort of underscore on that as well is that it's not just data for the sake of data; it's it's quality data. So one of the things that we we speak about with our clients is and and, and our our partners is. It's good to have data. We have, everybody wants the data, but what, first of all, what are we going to do with that data, and what's the quality of the data? Because when we look at the different sources of data that are being fed, whether it's an underwriting decision, whether it's a retention decision, whether it's a decision around a cap, whatever the case may be, the quality of the data also matters. So it's not it's not just having it; it's having it and being able to assess the quality of it and see is it credible. Does, is it actually telling us what we need to know? And even as simple as how old is the data? One of the things that we we talk about when you look at just building values, for example, you know, building values that are that are older, 10 years plus valuation of projects, many things have changed in the last 10 years, inflation factors, et cetera. The quality of data is also critical. Yeah, lineage um, and uh, latency. Um, you're right. There are all these dimensions. Of, I think the market is getting much more um, sophisticated um, about dimensionizing, you know, the, the topic of data quality. In the past, it's tended to be synonymous with data completeness. You know, can you fill out the questionnaire? Can you complete the spreadsheet? Uh, can you tick the boxes? Uh, but that's a very narrow definition of quality, and and the market's evolved it to be. It's just not about completeness of the data. You know, it's also about the accuracy of the data. And the vintage of the data, high quality data may be great, but if it's three or four years old, it may not be relevant anymore. Um, and so there's this multi-dimensional data quality framework, which is you know putting more pressure on on uh, um, on ensuring the the validity, uh, granularity, yes, completeness, but also accurate and and uh, currency of the information that powers uh, these increasingly technical decisions that the underwriters are going through. To, uh, to assess the rate and to allocate capacity against the exposure, particularly in the CAD exposed regions. 
and it's and it's not only the underwriters it's it's also the the risks themselves that are looking at this data and we're getting this request on a very regular basis to say many of our clients uh, retain uh, significant significant amounts of risk multinational organizations and so certainly from an underwriting perspective there's a tremendous appetite right now for data as you just mentioned uh, but if we take it even further we look at the actual risk managers need for data and what are how are they going to apply that data in terms of their decisions on, on retentions, on alternate uh, financing of the risk, et cetera. That's another factor. And then when we, when we think about it and we think about the market, we think about what does that property market look like, look like right now? Uh, what can we expect? I was reading just yesterday an article. I have it here in front of me. An article came out yesterday in Business Insurance. And it uh it related to the title of the of the article is property insurance price surge leads rate hikes. Um, this comes from this is an article based on the Council of Insurance Agents and Brokers, and it talks about the fact that commercial property premiums increased over 20% on average in the first quarter, which is by far the highest of all the lines, and compares with 16% in the prior quarter. And the large accounts, as they describe it in the article are the ones that are sustaining the greatest increases. Now, if I look across the industry, there's gonna be different numbers in terms of percentages of, of increase in rate. This one here says over 20%. I've seen others that say, you know, low double digits and things like that. But regardless of the exact number, everyone agrees that the rates continue to increase and are really not expected to decrease or even for that matter, stabilize anytime soon. And as a consequence of that, um, or one of the consequences of that is that risk managers, the risk managers that we deal with on a day in day out basis are choosing to retain more risk. Mm -hmm. So as I mentioned just a moment ago, the, the evolution of that data, the, the, the process of collection of the data, the quality of the data are becoming um, an actionable or an actionable source of mitigation and risk transfer options to the risk manager now. So it's it's critical when we look at the at the overall market and how it's evolving, not only from the perspective of underwriting, but also from the perspective of the risk managers. Yeah, Peter, the uh, the uh, the the article that you you uh, kind of uh, pinged off of, um, you know. It's a, it's, it's, it, yeah, it's a tough market and, and, and you raise a couple of really important points I, I'd love to dive into, but just briefly on the, on the rate increases, I think it's, you know, a, the folks at Aon have published that this is either the seventh or the eighth year of, of double digit price increases in property. Um, so, you know, it's a, yeah, it's been a tough renewal season for those in the market with their four ones and five ones and six ones and seven ones, in part due to the one one reinsurance uh, uh, treaty renewal cycles that just happened a few months ago. But this has been going on for years. Um, and it's started to change behaviors and expectations of the risk managers, right? It's it's like it's, it's not just a you know one you know bad market cycle and then things revert to normal. This has been persisting for years and it's getting to the point where, as you also noted, Peter, it's not just about rate, it's about capacity. You know, some top tier owners are having a hard time, you know, you know, irrespective of the rate, filling out their programs, uh, particularly in peak accumulation zones. And and uh, you know, and, and I, I you know, one of the things I I love working with you, Peter, is that you guys have such a tremendous perspective because your business is grounded not with the insurers, but with the actual managers of the risk, which is the, the owners of the assets and the physical exposures and the risk management teams who are responsible for not just procuring insurance, but for actively managing the risk. And as, a, as an ex-cap modeler, sometimes I feel like Alice, you know, through the looking glass in Wonderland, because all those years I served the insurance companies and the reinsurance companies helping them to better underwrite and price their catastrophic risks and develop best practices and processes and training generations of, of, uh, of teams. Uh, but going upstream into the risk management community, the owners of the assets, there's a whole different perspective. And as you note, um, these folks are not just you know, responding to market pressures and price increases and spending more money. They're rethinking their risk management strategies. These are rational, sophisticated risk management teams of top tier corporations with very sophisticated management practices. And they're saying, okay, we're now paying more. 
we're now retaining more risk. We're now forming captives to systematically insure ourselves. Uh, wait, risk management is not just a procurement of insurance. It's the assessment and management of the facilities so that we can reduce the risk, to mitigate the risk. What's the ROI on investments to make my risk harden my assets, make them more resilient? And there's a whole upstream world, which is how do I actively manage these risks? And one facet of that is purchasing insurance. But increasingly with the top tier risk management teams at the top tier corporations, they're thinking you know, risk management is no longer synonymous with insurance procurement. It's about actively managing the risk. And you know, that, that even further, you know, as, as you noted, Peter, it's not just about data for the sake of giving information to the underwriters. It's also about data so these risk management teams. So you, you know, those of you listening, you know it, like you're driving more decisions yourself. You're trying to get more proactive about your risk. You're not waiting for the market to tell you what your risk is. You know your risk. You operate these assets. You walk those roofs. You've built many of these buildings. You're accountable for the processes and activities that are happening inside of them. You know your risk better than anybody. And with data and harnessing data, you know whether it's data from physical inspections or data from sensors or data from, from documents and data from uh, you know, uh, analytics, you're, you're driving more proactive understanding yourself, irrespective of the market, of what is your risk how do I reduce my risk? How do I optimize my risk? How do I best structure and transfer my risk? And you're using data and analytics increasingly to make those decisions yourself. Uh, and then, of course, uh, the byproduct of that increasingly is the the uh, be able to share that with the markets uh, to uh, to secure uh, 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 differentiated outcomes. And it's like it's like the script is uh, flipping. Like one of my advisors is to say, like you know. Be careful about uh, the uh, pronouncing things syllable. It's actually syllable. It's the same word, but it has a different emphasis. Where a lot of the data challenges in the past were collect data so I can share it with my markets. But Peter, as you call out, now the syllable is syllable has become a syllable, which is collect data so I can make better decisions. And oh, by the way, now the exhaust of that better decision is a good data set that I can now share with my insurers as a kind of secondary benefit. The primary benefit is these are my assets. This is my operations. I need to ensure the resiliency of my property and my business activities associated with the property. I'm going to drive better decisions on better data myself. Um, and that shift is huge. And as you've been, you know, showing me as well, Peter, as we we go shoulder to shoulder together, you know, these top tier owners are are, are taking control. Uh, they want better information to make better decisions. And that we, we could take that, I think, even a step further at this point. When we think about when we think about the risk man the, the conversations that we're having with our clients, which are primarily risk managers, today versus the conversations we were having with risk managers even as recently as four or five years ago, the the risk managers have are being uh, tasked with new areas of responsibility that have not traditionally been been within their area of control or influence. Um, as we communicate, meet with clients, speak with prospective clients, it's very clear that the uh, the task of the risk manager today has expanded significantly. There's a lot of new areas that risk managers are being asked to um, comment on and to plan for and and to and to look at mitigation and risk transfer options. I'm talking about things like, for example, climate change, sustainability, all the ESG topics that that are that are everybody was talking about certainly at, at RIMS and at other events, our risk managers now are being asked to provide uh, opinions on those types of risks and furthermore to to quantify those types of risks and to come up with plans to either mitigate them or to transfer them that these are these are new areas and and I will even take it a step further than that and that's to say that the role of the risk manager today um, in many cases, is now getting board level attention. Mm -hmm. um, whereas you mentioned before about the you know placement of insurance, placement of the risk, it's it's much more than that for the for the larger progressive, let's call them progressive risk managers that I deal with, uh, that we deal with here at GRC. Uh, we talked about climate, we talked about sustainability, but also there's additional regulatory impacts that we think about not only domestically but also internationally. There's other risks that are very much front and center 
um, geopolitical risk, political violence. These are all things that, that risk, manager think, or risk managers are thinking about today on, in some cases, unfortunately, on a daily basis, but certainly these things are happening and they need a solution. In addition to that, we also have the entire global economic environment right now that we're all working in. But the risk managers are looking at that and looking at their facilities in different parts of the of the of the world and saying when i think about supply chain uh when, when i think about the risks associated with the supply chain either within a, a client's operation or without a client's outside of a client's operation that global economic situation can be very significant um depending on where they are and how they're connected and on top of that, and then I'll pass it back to you, Hema, is these we're also looking at the consideration of a number of non-traditional um, insurance solutions. The predictive analytics that Archipelago is involved in using the artificial intelligence, this is something that is on the mind of many of the risk managers that we're speaking with, saying, okay, we hear about it. That's great. What does it mean to me? What, 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 what can I do with that? Captives. Um, although captives aren't new, um, we certainly see a, a an enhanced role of captives, especially in the property spaces, which we're, which we're really focused on here. Captives are being used more and more um, as a way to finance that 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 property risk. Capital markets are out there as different types of facilities are available now, and then we have, of course, alternative providers, digital providers, insure tech providers like Archipelago, who now have an important uh, an important role to play in this property risk ecosystem that we're all active in. I mean, what do you think about that? Yeah, when you were describing the uh, the evolving role of the risk manager and how they're increasingly, you know, have a seat at the table, including at the C level, um, I, you know, I was I I, I was thinking about uh, one of our our mutual customers that we both were chatting with um, in Atlanta, you know, risk management team of a very large, sophisticated manufacturing company. And yes, I mean, that's, I mean, as I've gone through the looking glass, I've been really impressed and struck by the, the uh, proactiveness uh, of the risk managers I've had a chance to get to know. And yeah, increasingly, they are, they are seeing an imperative and an opportunity, an opportunity uh, to contribute to their company's resiliency um, as the domain expert, yes, on risk and insurance, but also on risk management and resiliency. And this is a really exciting shift uh, for the risk management profession, where there's an opportunity to cross over, you know, like a crossover, you know, hit on the charts, you know, to cross over from, you know, being a leader in the risk management and insurance domain um, and focusing on insurance specifically to more broadly, insurance is a piece of a resiliency management domain which has C-level attention. It's not just about the insurance policy, it's about the resiliency of the company, its viability, its risks and contingencies, its mitigation strategies, uh, its upstream and downstream. It's today, yes, in the next year of policy, but you know some of these, the, the, the risk management teams, these companies who are buying insurance, yeah, they buy insurance annually, but the exposures they're, 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 they're managing you know, are multi-year, multi-decadal, and they're thinking ahead. They're not looking thinking just the next year's, you know, insurance renewal. They're thinking how to get my head around and my hands around the risk profile using data and analytics, the risk today, but what's it going to be in 10 or 20 years from now? How does that affect decisions I need to make now? Uh, because the future is coming fast. We're already seeing the first, you know, sort of order effects of a changing climate affecting frequency and severity today. It's not just about, you know, some IPCC report about 2030 or 2035. It's like 2023, 2022, 2021. It's happening now. And yes, these risk management teams are having the opportunity uh, to contribute to their business strategy, not just to the insurance procurement strategy or the insurance management strategy. It's the business strategy. It's the resiliency strategy. Um, and this is a huge opportunity for the risk management profession uh, to cross over uh, from one you know, one uh, chart uh, to another uh, uh, and uh, make a real impact as a key partner to the business and to the stakeholders that are driving the business um, of uh, of these enterprises. You know, Hamid, as you were speaking, I was thinking about 
the 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 phrase total cost of risk right that very commonly used the insurance industry t core total mm -hmm. cost of risk and if you take that concept of total cost of risk and turn it upside down which is effectively what you were just doing you were turning that total cost of risk upside down and saying what is the total economic gain of risk or what is the what what is what is the we, we could say the total gain of risk as a as a, as a, a former colleague of mine used to say rather than looking at it purely from a perspective of cost and expense how do we look at the management of risk in a proactive way as a gain and as a as a uh, an opportunity for competitive differentiation as well if i can do a better job of understanding assessing mitigating my risk I am putting my my organization into a better financial position. So rather than looking at it from a perspective of the cost, what what I'm what I heard you just say is let's turn that back, turn it upside down, and say let's take that whole concept of how we manage risk not as a as a, as a as a as a cost to us, but really as a way for us to have an economic gain, an economic advantage from the risk that we're trying to manage. Uh, yeah, that that it's giving me goosebumps, Peter. Uh, th what you what you're describing, it just it's just uh, recalling. I had a uh, recently had a lunch uh, with uh, one of my customers, a top tier risk manager, uh, who's also been a great partner and a good friend um, as we've gotten to know each other over the past few years. And uh, he was describing this very uh, dynamic, your this inversion that you're describing, where you know this particular risk manager uh, serves a large institutional owner of commercial property. And what he was increasingly exploring and we were brainstorming, what he wants to do is the risk man, the global head of risk management is yes, he's managing the risk, securing capacity, data-driven decisions to make better outcomes. But he's also actively thinking and talking to his colleagues in the heart of the core business. How do we imbue into our properties uh, differentiated levels of resiliency that affects the front office of our business because we're in the business of leasing property to top tier corporations who lease our property for critical business operations. If we can differentiate our property's resiliency and quantify that, that increases the attractiveness of our product, i.e. the property and our ability to uh, market and sell that and differentiate our business to our customers. And I was like, I kind of blew my mind. I sort of leaned back and said, yeah, this is exactly what you're talking about, Peter. It's like, the, it's this inversion of the thought process, which is I, you know, from, I collect information, fill out a spreadsheet. I got to share that with my insurance markets to get insurance to flip the script completely, which is how do I make better decisions? Yeah, I need data for that to impact the, the improve the performance of the business. And, <laughs> and that also has, you know, impact on insurance, but it's a complete inversion of the thought process, um, and it's really exciting. And, and you know, I, I think this is, you know, the, you know, I, you know, I think it's a golden era for the risk management community uh, to uh, to not only you know demonstrate its ability to create value in the insurance context, but upstream in the core business of these enterprises in increasing the resiliency, the business value proposition of that resiliency. One more quick comment on that, Hemant, um, because you, you you had me thinking there, and uh, think about the. The risk management function and the importance of it today. Uh, some of the clients that we met with at RIMS, whether it was an official capacity or an unofficial capacity, what I noticed is that they're taking a certain amount of pride in terms of how the risk management function is actually impacting their brand reputation. Mm -hmm. um, this is particularly notable in the area of, for in the areas of, for example, sustainability, right? A, a lot of a lot of organizations are doing that, but it goes beyond sustainability, to the point where some of the risk managers that we were speaking to were saying, "Hey, look, you know what? Not only are, not only are we doing the right thing for our organization, we're actually taking it beyond that to not only to not only to our physical uh, properties, but also to our employees and also to our broader stakeholder of suppliers. So we're we're taking the position of our risk management function is making our company that much more resilient, as you say, um, but not only to us and our employees, um, it's also to the community, to our suppliers, to our community, to the point where some of them even went as far as to say, our, 
not only our employees, but the entire community around the areas that we work are subject to the decisions that we're making from a risk management perspective. So it's not just even looking at our own internal uh, concerns, which obviously are critical. It goes beyond that to our brand and our community. Yeah, this is this is uh, such an opportunity for the risk management community to be the heroes and the heroines of this more elevated business uh, and mission-driven um, uh, contribution that this profession is so well positioned, you know, at the intersection of the physical exposures that these corporations own and operate, which after all is much of the built environment. You know, mm -hmm. this is not like some niche we're talking about. These entities, whether they're prop codes or op codes, that's this, the built environment is owned and operated by these companies. Uh, and uh, and to elevate the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the resiliency of these assets um, it has benefit far beyond just the uh, the proverbial four walls of one you know PNL of one company, but it affects you know society as well. And that and that and you know Peter, that's one of the things that's always motivated me is is uh, is is this mission driven about how can better risk management uh, not only create more efficient and effective insurance outcomes, but more fundamentally, how can more effective risk management and insurance decisions power better decisions that mitigate risk and increase global resiliency. And one of the things that's in most exciting, I mean, this is, you know, uh, you've been serving these uh, these risk management teams of large institutions uh, for many years, and it's relatively new for me crossing over from, from the insurance uh, uh, kind of, you know, balance insurers as the main focus to the owners of the assets, the main focus, but, you know, the ability to actually, these folks are the owners of the risk. Uh, they're the operators, the risk, and this is how you bend the curve on resiliency is by empowering these risk management teams to empower their corp their companies to improve the risk profile of their businesses and assets. That's how you improve global uh, resiliency. And, and I, I'm so excited by this conversation. We could talk all, all day, Peter, and we'll uh, continue this discussion gonna... in, in New York over dinner soon. Um, we got that date on the calendar. But um, you mentioned, if I just, if I may, you mentioned the word uh, the sustainability initiatives. One thing that I'm also noticing, which is both both an opportunity to improve and an opportunity uh, that, that's very exciting, is that right now it sometimes does feel like there's a blood-brain barrier between the world of the risk manager and the insurance program and the decisions being made and the ESG and R teams that are trying to drive sustainability initiatives in their companies. And the, the, the top risk managers are finding ways to cross over and say, look, there's a sustainability agenda, there's a resiliency agenda that's being driven by board level of imperatives on a global scale. And the risk management community has tremendous expertise and data to help inform those decisions. And so you see this; these worlds have been kind of separate for a while and they're starting to cross over where it's not risk management is synonymous with insurance and ESG is, is synonymous with res resiliency, but these worlds are crossing and top risk managers are, are bringing to the table the data and insights technically they have about the risks uh, to that conversation. And that's a very exciting opportunity for the risk management community. And Hemet, you said it right uh, just a moment ago, we could go on on this topic for a few more hours over dinner or, <laughs> or, or elsewhere easily, but I think we need to bring it to a little bit of a con conclusion here for the for the benefit of our, our, of our audience. Um, Jared, I'm going to I'm going to make a quick closing comment here and then I'll pass it over to Hemet to take a quick closing comment and um and then we can open it up to any questions. So, I just wanted to sort of in in one of the things I wanted to sort of end with here is that when we think about managing risk today, managing risk today is a team effort. There really is no single source out there that has the answers to everything that a risk manager needs. It doesn't exist. There's, and, and, and it doesn't need to exist because there's an entire network, there's an entire ecosystem out there right now working, working on these issues from various, from various perspectives. This uh, a strategic and holistic approach is optimized when we include all the stakeholders and all the all the um, values that we would get from the people from the organizations in these ecosystems, from the risk manager perspective, from the brokerage and risk advisor perspective, from the uh, independent and impartial technical consultants, from the underwriting uh, community, from the reinsurance community, from the insured tech community. All of these areas have a 
uh, all of these areas, all of these, uh, these, these, these businesses have something to say and being able to bring them together is really the, the, the solution that most, especially the more sophisticated risk managers are going to want. And all of this, as I see it, is underpinned by the criticality of data and analytics such as our archipelago is doing, leading the way, leading the charge on these types of things. And we, I'll, I'll say it just as, as my closing remark here is Global Risk Consultants, GRC, um, we're very proud to be partnered, Hemet, with you and with Archipelago. We have a natural synergy in terms of what we do. But I would say to anybody listening, it doesn't mean that GRC and Archipelago have the answers for every single thing. It's, 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 I, I don't position us that way. Um, there's other uh, groups that are other uh, areas that are involved as well, but we're very happy to have it. And we're very ha happy to have this relationship with you and continue this dialogue as I'm sure we will in short order with our clients, with our prospective clients, with our channels, and of course, together. Thank you, Hemet. Yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, it's it's an it's a it's an honor and a privilege to be your partner. You guys are great partners, and yes, it's an ecosystem. Um, and uh, you know, it's 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 firms like ours. It's uh, the leading brokers and insurance markets have tremendous expertise. It's about harnessing and uh, and the you know the best solutions um, the risk managers are can can get are are blended and crafted to take advantage of the you know the differentiated capabilities of their partners. Um, that uh, and there's quite an ecosystem. I'll maybe just I'll just uh, close by saying you know it's a challenging market, um, as as uh, Peter you you uh, uh, you and I have discussed. It's also a golden age of risk management, and uh, you know I think this is this is you know those of you who are risk managers you know at this time and place you know this is the golden age of risk management. It really matters what you do. Really matters. You've got an opportunity to drive true differentiation, not only in your insurance outcomes, but in how your company manages, assesses and manages and mitigates its risk and increases its resiliency. And I think this is a tremendous opportunity uh, to be heroes and heroines in driving positive outcomes for your business and for society as a result. And uh, we're all going to step up and do it together. Great. Thanks, everybody. I mean, that, that was him and Peter. That was terrific. Um, you know, I, I certainly learned a lot. I'm sure the audience did as well. Um, I have a couple of follow-ups I'd love to ask. And and um, uh, let me start with this first one here. So the convergence of trends that we're seeing, such as the hard market, devastating NATCATs, decreased insurance capacity, won't last forever. Would a softening market or mild NATCAT year change the need for a strong approach to property insurance data? So I'll, I'll take a I'll take an initial crack at it, Hemet, and I'll pass it over to you. So uh, a soft market. So the market cycles in insurance have been changing for in the last 50 to 75, 75 years, we, it so happens that at the moment we're in a sustained hard market, especially on the property side. Um, underwriters and actuaries in insurance uh, carriers are obviously looking at this. All these conversations that we're having right now, they're having these conversations as well. They're looking at this as well. And they, they know what to expect. And they have priced into their models what to expect. Um, are they going to be, do they have, do they have the capacity? Do they want to have the capacity? What is their appetite for certain industries? What is their appetite for, even for that matter, different lines of business as, as the case may be? I think that if we look at the, the forecasts, uh, the future forecasts of what's, of what's coming, the, for the most part, the underwriting communities have that um, considered in terms of how they're moving forward. If there were to be a, a change uh, in, in, in terms of the way that uh, actuaries and underwriters are looking at uh, the future, future risk, ultimately, I think that would have an impact. I don't see that happening in, the, in, in, in the short term, to be honest with you, because they're always, they're always planning up. You know, they're not planning for the current year. They're planning for four, five, six, seven years into the future. And they're looking at it in a similar way. Hemet? Yeah, I think the fundamentals have changed. And I think what we've been experiencing the past several years is a secular change in the market that's likely to persist uh, for the foreseeable future. Great. Um, here's another question. You mentioned a bifurcated market, which is really challenging in certain areas. 
you know, colleagues who were in the business back in 1986 know that that was a truly hard market where getting covered at all was a challenge. And I'm curious, what could the future hold for businesses in severe NACAT regions? Could it, could it get that bad? Um, I think that what the, if, if we go back to what we were talking about a moment ago, to reversing the thought of total cost of risk with a total economic gain of risk. If we look at, at your question and we say, okay, if, we, if, if I'm a risk manager and, and I've got properties that are uh, nat cat exposed more so than others, um, what am I going to do about that risk? Right? How, how am I going to try to optimize that risk? And there's many different ways to do that. But I see that. I, I do look at this from an opportunity perspective as opposed to a cost perspective. What we, what we, will, what we will see, what I would expect to see, is the use of different options to finance and mitigate and manage risk. I mentioned captives before. Captives are not new, um, but they're being used more commonly now, especially in the property market. Um, we see, for example, parametric insurance uh, being a much more common solution to some of our risk managers. And there's a variety of other non-traditional insurance um, uh, financing options out there right now, which are going to provide different solution sets to the risk manager, different things to consider. And by the way, all of this, whether whether we're talking about captives, or we're talking about parametric insurance, we're talking about um, different types of, of financing facilities, et cetera. All of this, we bring it all back. The fundamental or the foundation of all of these and these decisions that are going to be made is data. Isn't that right, Hammond? Yeah, the, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the capacity is quite dear right now and particularly in peak accumulation zones, cat accumulation zones. Um, we hear all kinds of interesting stories about in uh, outcomes in say Cal Quake, for example, but it's peak accumulation zones or cats. So it's it's dear, you know, you know, if you step back, you know, one way for the insurance industry to avoid paying claims is not to write any business. Now that's not a winning business strategy uh, because at some point, the whole point of the exercise is to create capacity solutions that enable your customer to better manage and transfer the risk at fair prices they can afford to pay and you have a marketplace. Um, I am, I, I do uh, agree, Peter, with you that I think ultimately, you know, one of the most profound changes we might see that is powered by better data mm -hmm. is that the better data and analytics can create and catalyze new innovation on how capacity solutions are defined, structured, and enabled. And so I think there's going to be opportunities. You, you named some of the types of vehicles that I think we're going to see more of, which are innovative new products being developed, powered by data uh, that enable new forms of coverage to be available and capacity to be provided for some of these challenging areas. Um, and uh, we could have a whole conversation on uh, on uh, you know, you know alternative risk transfer and insurance link securities and catastrophe bonds and you know what might be possible there. But I think uh, the market will innovate. And but the common denominator is increasingly the currency of the realm is going to be again. Do you have the data? Uh, if you do, you're probably going to be able to access alternative sources of capacity. If you don't have the data, you're not. And I, and I, I would add one more thing to what you just said, Hamid, because we could we could continue this conversation very easily. But one of the one of the things that uh, we together are also uh, helping our clients with is telling their story, right? So um, telling the story of the way an organization manages uh, addresses risk is critical today, and of course, it's founded on data. Um, but it's also, it goes beyond just the data. It also becomes a qualitative and a quantitative story. One of the things that, that we spend a lot of time on is working independently with our clients, separate from any uh, uh, brokerage or, or insurance uh, relationships, to really sort of independently look at and evaluate the way a client is managing that risk. It's very credible. It's very credible, of course, to do that. It, it adds to the credibility to add the data to it. But being able to describe all those things that are happening are going to have an impact also on future on, on future on a client's future ability, whether whether they choose to transfer the risk, whether they choose to retain the risk, whether they choose to use some of these alternative um, options out there. 
the quality of that risk has a direct bearing on the way they're going to have access to those types of solutions. That's great, guys. Um, another question here. Um, are certain industries more susceptible to rate and property market issues? And, and are those folks in those industries maybe need a better approach to data? I, I would, so what we're seeing from a GRC perspective is certainly the industries that are, I mentioned a few of them before, I mentioned food and beverage, I mentioned hospitality, I mentioned gaming, um, at, at the moment um, have seen um, higher increases, but that, that that's, that's at the moment. What we would say broadly is that the, uh, from our perspective, the higher hazard risks, the risks that are more complicated and more complex, more difficult, frankly, to understand, um, the risks that have significant supply chains, um, the risks that have um, significant contingent business interruption exposure are the ones that are going to, that, that are non-homogenous, um, are the ones that are going to be more difficult in principle, more difficult to manage that risk, but also then from a, when, when we look at it from the outside, from telling that story, their heart, that risk is a little bit harder to understand. So in my view, it's the, it's the, it tends to be the higher hazard, more complex, non-homogenous risk. That is, that is the risk that is going to be more under duress, if you will, in this market. Absolutely. Well, um, that's all the questions we have. So I want to uh, thank you again, Peter and, and Hemant. Um, and uh, now I'm going to go back to Justin for a closing word. All right. That was great. Rims would like to thank Hemant Shah of Archipelago and Peter Lin and Jared Shelley of Tubesud Global Risk Consultants for their time and expertise. A copy of this webinar will be available on the on-demand events page of rims.org within a few business days. For more information about Tubesud, you can visit tuvsud.com. Folks, let me just tell you real quick about a RIMS workshop that ties into this very nicely. We have a three-part virtual workshop series to improve your knowledge and enrich your risk program with the best practices in data management, analytics, and AI. The first workshop in the series will be June 15th. Enroll now and learn more at go.rims.org slash data workshops. The RIMS Canada Conference will be held in Ottawa, September 11th through the 14th. To inquire about sponsorship and registration, visit rimscanadaconference.ca. Last but not least, RIMS is global. We'd love for you to build your network with us. Visit rimsorg slash membership to apply for a RIMS membership. It's great to see you all again. Saw you a couple of weeks ago. That was fantastic. Looking forward to the next time. Thank you all and stay safe.